Hey, uh, we are almost upon Father's Day, and I want to give a big shout out to all the great fathers out there. Those who aren't really living up to what uh, you should be as a father, I pray for you, and I ask that you do all that you can to become an awesome dad. Um, it is no doubt that over time, dads have become less and less uh, important, uh, and their role as a father has become less and less important in the family. Uh, Satan has been very successful at attacking the family, uh, and he started by removing the father, the father figure, and the duties of the father from the family. And so I want to tell you, if, you, if you're able to succeed in being a, an awesome dad in your family, God bless you, more power to you. Keep on doing it. If you got a chance and an opportunity to ever groom a young man, uh, make sure you do that so that he in return can be a great father as well. So we're going to talk real quickly five ways you can be an awesome dad. We're going to use some biblical references and some of their stories to kind of flush that out and unpack uh, what it means to be an awesome dad. So without further ado, here you go. And happy Father's Day in 2023 to you. Uh, God bless. Back in the day, uh, you can look at some of these uh, photos and and kind of know who's who and what time period we're talking about. Um, dads were very well respected, very well known as being the moral uh, leaders of the family, uh, as much as being able to teach their kids and Unfortunately, I think some of these shows kind of showed the dad by himself and not really a team member with the mom, but some of the shows did. Uh, so we had a good mix, I think, going on back in the day. And you can tell by these shows, you know, what the scenarios were that they had to deal with with their kids. Some had a lot of kids. Some had the average 2.5, whatever kids it is in America today. And of course, some had just the one. But uh, you could go back and see why these shows were so very important. And still today, people enjoy them because I believe the father was held in high esteem and the father had a role uh, that you just don't see being played out too often in today's media. And uh, we'll look at that now. As time went on, almost in a, in a clear transition from the 50s, early 60s into the late 60s, early 70s, you can start seeing the switch up from responsible dads to irresponsible dads, smart, loving, caring dads to those who were just kind of stupid, didn't know what they were doing, and the wife had to really take control, not only of the kids, but of him as well. And you can look at these pictures and see some of those shows that dictated that. Bewitched in particular had a lot of uh, background in regarding the fact that women's uh, ability to run the household, that's where that uh, foundation came from, from what I understand. I don't know how true that is, but there was a study done on it. Look it up, the study on Bewitched, uh, the show, and how women uh, would, would rule over men. But you kind of see that a little bit in regards to how she behaved uh, and how her mother behaved and how they treated uh, both the Darrens. You got both the dark haired and the other, well, they both had dark hair. The tall and the short Darren, I guess is what I would say. But anyway, and, and then you got uh, a little bit more uh, of, of the Flintstone thing where he's, he's just a babbling idiot and of, well, Herman Muster as well. And then there comes how we get into the 90s, the 2000s, and current day dads that are just depicted as good for nothings almost. You know, the American dad, I mean, yeah, he's a, he's a provider, and that's pretty much about it. You got Homer again. He's been around for a while now. He's one of the longest running cartoon dads or animated dads in history. So he's had an influence on a lot of people for a lot of years. Um, you got, uh, Peter down here in the, in the far left corner, who's just a complete nut. And you got the young man in, uh, I forgot his, uh, the show, 
but uh, he's a drunk, and his kids are pretty much running the show while he's out doing whatever he does. So you've got a, a very clear distinction between the dads of old and the dads of now. And that is not what we really should be pro, uh, promoting as, as, as people who care about families and kids and marriages. Anyway, mass media does this, and it's called the framing effect. I don't know if, for those of you in, who've been involved in television at all, you know what I'm talking about. For those who don't, here's a little exp uh, explanation of it. Framing makes pieces of information more noticeable, meaningful, and memorable to the audience that they're trying to capture. Framing also determines what people notice, how they evaluate what they notice, and how they act upon their evaluation of what they've noticed. Framing places an emphasis on certain actions of the subject and forms a particular portrayal of that subject. Perfect example. Nowadays, the more, one of the more uh, prominent videos out there that people kind of, or video that people have captured, and there's more than one, unfortunately, but of the president, uh, the current president, President Biden, falling. Yeah, he's he's fallen <laughs> on several occasions, unfortunately, but media uses this, and, and people tend to use this as well to form an opinion about him and form a, the way that he leads the country in the same manner. That's a form of framing, if you will. We frame up how we want our uh, agenda to go, and based on this is where we want our agenda to start at, uh, or our narrative, I should say, not our agenda, but our narrative. Next, uh, these actions are detrimental to fatherhood. What you see on television day, what you see on talk shows, what you may see on different uh, social media platforms is detrimental to fatherhood. Some other things that we probably don't think about that leads us to a way of thinking about men and fathers in particular is when we compare them to other dads or when we compare them to other men. The wife should never compare your man to another man. That is a, a slippery slope that you should never attempt to even go down. Because it, all it does is make uh, you focus more on something that your man is not and less about what he really is. He may not be the most clean-smelling man, but he may be the hardest-working man around. He may not be the most intelligent man or the most uh, woodworking guy or, or mechanically inclined kind of guy but he helps around the house. He helps with the kids. He's supportive to you. And when you start comparing your man to other men and saying, why can't you be this? Or why don't you do that? Or why can't you be more like? You are going down a slippery slope and you are adding all kinds of negativity into your marriage and you are breaking the spirit of a father. Don't ever demean him, especially in front of his children. If you've got a problem with something, you all talk about it offline together when you're alone. Focus on his flaws. It's something we talked about a little bit earlier with the comparison, but always look for the strong points. What brought you into a relationship with that person in the first place? And I'll, and I'll give you a perfect example I'm talking about. Many times uh, when a relationship is young, for example, if the guy is fun loving, He's full of, uh, of jokes and laughing and always having a good time. You know, that's what attracted to you, uh, attracted him to you or you to him in the first place. But then as you got married and he still, he's, that's his personality trait, one of them anyway. Now when it's not funny or you don't want to be funny anymore, it becomes an irritant to you. Now he's just childish, immature, and he plays too much. Okay, it, it, that's what I'm talking about right there. A character trait that once interested you and made you happy is now an irritant and makes you disappointed. Can't have it both ways. Being critical of his efforts. A man who tries to please his wife and tries to be there for his family is better than a man, a lot of men nowadays, 
who aren't even engaged whatsoever. One of the dumbest things I hear people say nowadays is my baby daddy is babysitting his daughter or his son or his kids. Babysitting, that's a job for teenagers. When you watch your kids and you lead your kids, that's called parenting, not babysitting. But we've got it so twisted these days, we think the guy's doing something special when he comes around every so often and spends a little bit of time with his kids, probably not even spending time with his kids, just there because you can't be there right then and there. Emasculation of any kind of your husband is not godly and is not good for any kind of relational uh, benefits. Unfortunately, shaming men has become a very popular activity in today's society. Just look at the commercials, look at the television shows out there, look at some of the things that people have to say on social media and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. It is a common pastime these days to do it. All right, here's our first example of an awesome dad. Not perfect. None of these guys are perfect. Nobody that we're going to talk about is perfect. None of us are perfect. And none of our wives are perfect. We all have a sinful nature about us. We all have imperfections and we all have failed at some point and at some time at something. Okay? But these are some very good things to notice about people in the Bible that God considered to be good, righteous people, that's, uh, and we need to take from them. Noah, he believed in God when everybody else around him thought he was crazy. He kept doing everything God asked him to do because he had faith and he believed God at his word, and he raised his children to be the same way. His actions proved to be a crucial element in the preservation of not only his family, but the rest of the world. Awesome dad, Noah. Isaac. Isaac was willing to be sacrificed because of the faith his father had in God. Isaac took on another wife, not the wife that he truly loved or wanted, and sacrificed himself until he could be with her. Then he found out that she was barren, and he became even more of a teammate for her, and he prayed for his wife, and God was able to open Rebecca's womb. Isaac, being the team player that he was, not only with his dad, but also with his two wives, he said that, you know, I, a, a good team uh, teammate is always going to cultivate good relations with everybody, because that's what they do. A good teammate in a marriage is going to respect and love his children's mother. They're going to see that their dad loves their mom and he respects her. He also is going to work and do everything that he can to lead his family the best that he can. Like I said, nobody's perfect. We're not looking for perfection here, but we are looking for progression, and we'll talk about that with another dad here in a few moments. Love. Love conquers all. And Moses was full of love. Moses did everything, and the primary motivation for what he did was love. Did he get angry? Absolutely. We all do. Okay? Did he get fearful? Absolutely. We all do. Once again, it's not about perfection. But when you look at Moses, everything that he did, he tried to do because, first of all, he loved God. And secondly, he loved his people. He might have made a mistake initially with his love for people, uh, his own people, when he killed the Egyptian, but that that's not where God left him. God used him later on, and he says, you know what? Love is an action word, but you punctuate your actions with the explanation point, explanation point by telling your family how much you love them. Do and say. They need to hear it, but they also need to see you do it. Moses loved his people, and he did so by giving them all of himself just about. He did the impossible. Some people would have left them alone a long time ago. And he, he led them during the, year, the most treacherous years of uh, being in the wilderness after they came out of Egypt. And he dealt with some crazy stuff. 
but he was a loving man. He did it all in love, even when they were the most unlovable people around. That's what loving people do. We love those who are hard to love. And Moses is one of those guys. Sometimes, fellas, we love our wives. We don't like them too much for whatever reason. They might have a, a, a bitter disposition. They might have a, a real smart mom, whatever the case may be. But we love our wives. Sometimes we just don't like them. And the same thing for them. They love us, but sometimes they may not like us. Love motivates everything. It should in, in, in the person who follows Christ. Joseph, another great man. Um, he was <laughs> not talked about much, but we know for a fact that Joseph was partially responsible for the upbringing of, of Christ. He was chosen because he was righteous. He could have put uh, Mary on blast, but he didn't. He says, I'm going to, I'm going to be, you know, cautious about this. And I'm not going to put her out there for everybody to just destroy. I am absolutely going to treat her with dignity. And then the angel came to him and he said, you know, this is what happened. And this is what you're going to do. And that is where we get the very, very basis of humility when it comes to being a dad. Joseph was a wonderful father figure for Jesus and to the children he later fathered as well. He refused to allow his wife to be hum humiliated or disgraced in public. And we should do the same things today. No matter how much we may be offended, angered by whatever our wives say or do, it is not on us to publicly humiliate her or anybody else for that matter, and our kids. Like the Bible tells us, do not break your kid's spirit. Don't do that. David, of course, uh, once again, not a perfect man. I'm going to move this down a little bit so you can see the PowerPoint a little better. Not a perfect man whatsoever, but he is, uh -oh. he is also known as the apple of God's eye. He was an amazing example a lot of times. He struggled a lot, but in the end, he came out to be a better man. He understood how to be a conqueror. He didn't let his pride get the best of him all the time. Yeah, he did at some point, especially with Bathsheba. But once again, nobody's perfect. We're not here. We're not looking for perfection. We're looking for progression. He knew when he dishonored God. He needed a little help at one point. But once he figured out it was him, he said, oh, I, I got to repent of this. And a whole psalm came out of it. He repented and returned himself back to God, and he was always a man after God's own heart. That's what God says about him, not what we think about him. That's what God said about him. Growing is crucial for any Christian dad. We are going to stumble. We are going to sometimes fall. But we got to get back up, dust ourselves off, and we have to learn from our mistakes and let our kids know that we are not perfect, and I'm sorry. It's some words that need to come out of our mouth. And David is one of those dads that we can look at who done that. Here's a nice little poem I'm going to end with today, but I want you to really examine what it says. Um, I'm sorry, I'm punching numbers, and this, this screen should not, this, this bar should not be up there. But anyway, it says, walk a little slower, slower, daddy. Walk a little slower, daddy said a little child so small. I'm following in your footsteps and I don't want to fall. Sometimes your steps are very fast. Sometimes they're hard to see. So walk a little slower, daddy, if you are leading me. Someday when I'm all grown up, you're what I want to be. Then I will have a little child who will want to follow me. And I will want to lead just right and know that I was true. So walk a little slower, daddy. For I must follow you. That's an unknown author, but it's a great poem that makes us understand just how important it is to lead our children and for us to be in a good, godly example for our children. That is your calling. That is, that is commanded by God that you teach your children about him and that you live a life that's going to make them 
understand what it means to have a heavenly father by being a good, godly, earthly father. And with that, once again, happy Father's Day. Thank you for every uh, always uh, chiming in. Like, comment, share, uh, and check out some of the other uh, lessons that I have on the site. Uh, this is, uh, oh my goodness, I keep doing that. This is uh, Adrian from um, Relevant Times Ministry. By all means, check it out and uh, subscribe if you want. I appreciate your time. Bye-bye.